Hey, what's up guys? This is Aaron J.P. Saria, so guys, E3A from Illinois Science Technology University. For today's video, we are going to talk about modern CPU architecture. So we are surrounded by CPUs, our processors, and the computing they do for us. They touch every aspect of our lives. CPUs are in our laptops, the machines that check the product, the grocery stores, the industries, and especially power the instruments in our car to make it more efficient. So what is CPU? CPU stands for Central Processing Unit and it's often called the brain of the computer. CPU sits at the center of everything in the computer and handles all the implementations needed to turn inputs from memory, like a photo on your hard drive into outputs on your peripherals like an image on your monitor. With the advance of silicon technology over time and our ability to continue miniaturizing transistors and make them more efficient, we've been able to pull more and more functionalities onto the same piece of silicon that contains a CPU. This ability to continue shrinking transistors is based on the famous law or observation that we, the industries, refer to the Moore's law. Moore's law is based on the observed trend showing that we can double the number of transistors per unit area about every two years. So who is Robert Noyce? Then, in 1959, Robert Noyce patented the first monolithic integrated circuit which combined multiple transistors on a single silicon chip. These early chips didn't have many transistors but they enabled much smaller and more complex circuit design. By 1968, several companies were making integrated circuits and Robert Noyce teamed up with the colleague Gordon Moore to get into the game, founding Intel, which was short for Integrated Electronics. And Yak, the first general purpose digital computer from 1946 covered 1800 square feet, or the size of the modern home, and weighed about 30 tons. And Yak, which stood for electronic numerical integrator and computer, and other earlier computers were built using vacuum tube technology, which made them huge and unreliable. So, this is the Intel on early years. On 1971, Intel 4004 was currently developed. To drive calculators, so it has 2,300 transistors and clock at 740 kHz. So at 1972, the 8008, the first 8-bit processor was made, and in 1974, Intel 8080 was developed. So it's boosting a clock speed of 2,000 megahertz and able to address 64 kilobytes memory. So, early the computers used this chip. 1975, the MOS 6502, which is powered such notable systems as the Apple V. On 1976, C-Log C80 was founded. And 1978 is the Intel 8086, the first x86 chip with 29,000 transistors and was clocked initially at 4.77 MHz. On 1979, Intel 8088, the last costly version of 8086, was developed. So this year, 11th gen Intel Core processor named Tiger Lake was released. So it is a 10 nanometer processor with a max speed clock rate of 5.0 GHz, as 2 to 8 cores. So next line is who is John von Neumann? John von Neumann popularized a new kind of computer architecture that simplified computer design and programming. So this von Neumann architecture separated units from processing information, so the CPU, from units that stored information, the memory, and allowed data and instruction to be stored and addressed in the memory in the same way. So there are a couple of concepts that are key to understand with regards to computer architecture. First is the notion and the use of binary system, and the second is that concept of computing abstraction layer. So first, there is a great power in the what the binary system allows us to do. So we're presenting data as a series of on and off states in the computer or memory. So we can simplify and create a foundation for computer engineers to do much more complicated tasks. So binary numbers are represented by 1 and 0. The second concept is that of computation abstraction layer. It's built things to up to complex application that runs in large data centers using transistors that are switches and connecting the in the outputs of one to the input of another. So we can build a variety of logic circuits or functional block. This functional block can take 
the form of adders, multiplex, decoders, latches, flip latch registers, counters, and etc. So next in line, we will talk about ISA or the Instruction Set Architecture. So ISA is a set of instructions that defines what kind of operations can be performed in the hardware. It is nothing more than the language of the computer. So the ISA is the dictionary of the instructions, data types, and the formats that the CPU adhering to that ISA must execute. Next in line is the micro architecture. So a micro architecture is the implementation or specific design of an instruction set architecture. So ISA is the software and the micro architecture is the hardware. So up here are four steps in making the micro architecture. The first step is to fetch or retrieve the instruction from memory so that the CPU knows what the program wants to execute. So this is called the fetch stage. So the next step is to decode the fetch instruction into native operations. This is called the decode stage. Then the CPU also compares data and makes decision about where to go next in the code. So we call these decision instruction branches as they call steer codes to different places. There are many other operations CPU to perform depending on the ISA and what we call the execute stage. Finally, the CPU will store those results. Sometimes those are saved locally in the registers and sometimes they are stored in memory. So this is called the write back stage. So a modern microprocessor has around 15 to 20 stages. The fetch and the code stage typically have 6 to 10 stages. So collectively these are called the front end of the microprocessor. Execute and write back have also grown into roughly 6 to 10 stages. These are called the back end of the microprocessor. So in next line, we are going to talk about CPU pipeline. So a CPU pipeline is a synchronous, and what we mean by that is each pipeline is controlled by a clock. So and each data goes from one pipeline stage to the next as the CPU clock completes a cycle. So the number of stages partially determines what the peak frequency of a CPU is. Now modern day CPUs can run over 5 GHz. So the amount of logic in each of these stages determines how fast the stages are clock can operate. If a CPU runs at 5 GHz, this means that the stages each needs to complete a 5 billion of a second. Remember, a hertz is one cycle per second. Modern CPU architecture can often predict branches with a near perfect accuracy that makes them seem almost playboy. When a microprocessor executes newer instructions than a branch without knowing if a branch is taken or not, it is referred to speculative execution. So this is the fundamental component in modern microprocessors for achieving great performance. Now branch predictors have become incredibly complex in order to improve their accuracy while still being able to steer fetching of instruction at the high frequency. Branch predictors today can oftentimes record and understand and learn the past history of hundreds, sometimes even more than that, thousands of branches before them in order to take a simple prediction of the news next branch and where it is going. So they've become so accurate that they are going in charge in deciding which address to fetch next. Superscalar execution, the basic ALU or arithmetic logic unit, can perform operations like adds and subtract. If we have a single ALU, this means we can do one add at a time, so which a referred to as scalar execution. Modern microprocessors now implement many ALUs, and we, when those ALUs can operate in parallel, this is called superscalar execution. So the number of operations that can be executed in parallel is one way to measure what we call the width of the microprocessor. All modern microprocessors are superscalar. This increases the demand on the front end, which is why it's important to design the front end that can fed instruction quickly to the back end. Now, depending on the target usage, designers can always decide to increase the super scalability of the SOCs by also adding more CPU cores in addition to more functional execution bugs within those cores. So, last topic we are going to deal with is the register renaming. A register renaming is the form of pipelining that deals with data dependencies between instruction by renaming their register operands. An assembly language, a programmer, or a compiler specifies these operands using architectural registers. These registers that are implicit in the instruction set architecture. So as time flies by, CPUs are still upgrading. Scientists and innovators been reaching the goals of creating the fastest CPUs for great performance as we are going to the techno work. So that's it. 
Thank you and have a good day.